The oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear, and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. H.P. Lovecraft. Death is what this story opens up with. A reanimated corpse now doomed to serve the people of Limbo Town. Clarion, our protagonist, looks out of his window and he says to his familiar cat Teekle, One day they will bury us too. My children will dig me out of the ground to work for them till I crumble. Why even bother being born? What's the point of it all? And his sister Beulah tells him not to think he can escape this either, even though Clarion's own father was the first and only person to have ever escaped Limbo Town. But no one's really sure what Clarion's father's fate was. Beulah then tells Clarion that he must be there when submissionary Judah brands the Grundy. Now, Grundy is basically their word for a reanimated zombie that is doomed to work for the town forever. And she says Clarion has to be there because the Book of Shadows dictates it so. But you see, the dead want to sleep. They don't want to be risen. But Judah, a submissionary, has the ability to brand a Grundy's mind so they will lose all free will and they will serve Limbo Town and their god, Croatoan. Limbo Town is inhabited by a group of people known as the Witch People. You have witch boys, witch girls, witch men, witch women. Not warlocks and witches, there are no warlocks, it's witch men, witch boys. It's very specific about that. And these people practice necromancy and witchcraft, but treat it as Puritans would have treated Christianity. After the branding, Tekel, Clarion's cat, appears with something in his mouth. Judah commands Tekel to remove it, and it is a dead Shida. And this is a terrible omen for the witch people. The returning of the Shida signal the end times. Judah even says while the witchman parliament debates, the world is falling down around them because having a parliament is like a completely new thing for the witch people. Meanwhile, Clarion's just like, I've never seen a Shida before. Can I touch it? And Judah leans in and says, would you be a submissionary? Is that the type of work, the type of burden you want for your life? And Clarion's just like, oh, I'm sure it's the kind of work I'd find really rewarding, like not really caring, like he's completely mocking Judah. Judah even acknowledges this and says, I do not like your mocking tone. You might be a magical genius, but you have a lot to learn in terms of the way of Croatoan and the Book of Shadows. Quick side note, if you don't know what the Shida are, please watch my Zatanna video. If you have seen that video and you still have no idea what the Shida are, please let me know in the comments down below and I might make a video dedicated to it. After all of this, Clarion's with his stepfather and the two of them are talking about how Clarion's father was a rebel. He defied the Book of Shadows and went past the Wicket Gate which is what seals off Limbo Town from the rest of existence. This allowed him to escape the fate of being a Grundy when he dies, meaning when he dies, he can rest. And Clarion's like, I just don't get this. We resurrect the dead because the Book of Shadows says so, but why do we have to do what the Book of Shadows says? And Clarion's stepfather is like, we do what the Book of Shadows says to preserve Croatoan, our god, from the taint of our forefathers' sins that caused them to run from the Blue Rafters, which is basically what their name is for the above world, which no witch person has seen in hundreds of years. But all of this is so frustrating for Clarion, he has no idea what his ancestors did to become exiled from the Blue Rafters, so he doesn't understand why their sins are his sins. His stepfather is eventually like, don't let the submissionaries hear you talk that way. Eventually, you will be a witch man and you will come to understand everything. Because when you're baptized, they take you to Croatoan. You actually meet the god face to face. But then Clarion's stepfather shows him a secret. He has something from the land above. He calls it a miraculous cake that's covered in an impenetrable covering. Obviously, it's just a chocolate bar, but to him it's the most amazing thing he's ever seen. This chocolate bar is so far beyond their comprehension that it's the most amazing thing to them. Like, they can't imagine something that's wrapped in this fabric that they've never seen before, and apparently it tasted like nothing else he'd ever had. It's just so far beyond his comprehension that he had to keep the wrapping for himself. Eventually, the town hall bell rings and everyone starts making their way to the town hall, and Clarion's stepfather does reveal to Clarion that he overheard a conversation and apparently Judah is planning on sealing the wicket gate, which would cut off the witch people from the rest of the world forever. This would serve submissionary Judah's own agenda because he believes the outside world would 
taint the witch people, which obviously he doesn't want, but Clarion wants to escape. He wants to be like his father and go explore. And Clarion's just like, what if we want to be impure? What about our own choices? And sure enough, at the town hall meeting, Submissionary Judah is like, it is the witch god Croatoan's will that the wicket gate be sealed and Limbo Town be cut off forever. Everyone else is so excited by this, but Clarion's just like, this means I will never get to High Market, which means I'll never get to the Blue Rafters, which means I'm going to be stuck in Limbo Town forever and doomed to become a Grundy. His sister makes fun of him because she knows that Clarion was planning on running away, and his mum's just like, well, why don't you become a farmer? Clarion sends Tikal away to go and spy on the submissionaries. Meanwhile, Clarion goes to see what his stepfather is up to. Apparently, all the witchmen are going past the wicket gate to see Croatoan one last time. Now, all the men going are part of the witchman parliament. Remember, Judah sees the parliament as a threat to the well-being of the witch people, which means it wasn't much of a surprise to Clarion when he saw three submissionaries casting some kind of spell. They're saying Horrigal Hunt over and over and over again. Come, Horrigal, come. And Clarion has a bad feeling about this, and he feels the need to go and warn all of the witchmen that have just left the wicket gate. Clarion runs as fast as his legs will take him, and when he comes to the wicket gate, he does hesitate, because by going past this gate, he is condemning every single thing he has ever been taught, everything he's ever learnt from his mother, his father before he ran away, his stepfather, and his school. And he takes a breath, and he bolts past it to go and warn everyone, just to find all of their dead bodies, and when he looks up, his eyes meet a horrible. Three submissionaries and their familiars merged into one monstrous being that exists to deal out punishment. The Horrigal tells Clarion because he went past the wicked gate, he has broke witch person law and must be be killed. Clarion's able to snatch a submissionary brand from the Horrigal and he uses it to have the Grundies attack a Horrigal, which gives Clarion enough time to run up the side of the mountain into High Market. He's running through these winding tunnels till eventually a bullet is shot at the Horrigal and it's another witchman there to protect Clarion. Clarion has no idea who this man is. But as this happens, something starts glowing and howling down one end of the tunnel and Clarion's never seen anything like this before. So the witch man leans in, pulls Clarion out the way, the Horrigal jumps and leaps for Clarion and is hit by the oncoming train. And this is when the witch man introduces himself as Ebenezer Bad. Bad basically questions Clarion on where he's from in Limbo Town and why he left. And he basically says to Clarion, you can either go back and face punishment or you can come with me, but I'm not sticking around till the Horrigal recovers because they always do. Clarion wants to go with him, but he's worried about Tikal because witch boys and their familiars share a soul, and if they're separated for too long, they die. And Ebenezer is like, your familiar's gonna find you, don't worry about it. They begin to travel through these waters that Bad refers to as the Night Rivers. Now the Night Rivers carry all the waste from the above world. And his own familiar, Fear Nought, an alligator, knows the rivers well. Bad then says on the day of his initiation into the Order of Witchmen, the void of existence was revealed to him, so he ran from it. And Clarion asks to see Croatoan for himself so he can do the same. Bad keeps trying to get Clarion to understand how hard life is outside of Limbo Town, but Clarion's just so excited because for his entire life he was told that there was nothing but rocks outside of Limbo Town. But he's here and there are all these tunnels and there's a river and there's lights and there's so many different things. And then he turns to one side and he sees a bunch of children all lined up against a wall. And Bad explains that these children are no longer just one being. They have joined their minds and their essences together to become a Leviathan. And this was obviously meant as a warning to Clarion. A Leviathan will kill anyone on sight. But Clarion's just like, oh my, a Leviathan made of children. What a world of mad wonders this is. As they near Croto and Clarion's like, have you ever seen my father on your travels? And Bad is just like, I, I don't know who your father is, sorry. Then when Clarion steps into the house of Croto the one truth of all witch men is revealed to him. Croatoan is an absent god. He disappeared a long time ago. 
Only his chains and a single small dice remains, and Clarion decides that he's gonna keep the dice for himself to remind him of this void. And Clarion laughs at this on the outside because now he's like, well, I guess this means I get to be a witch boy forever, but on the inside, he's clearly hurt and doesn't want to show this to Ebenezer Bad because this is the foundation of everything he was raised on proved to be non-existent before his eyes. After this, Clarion is taken to a place called Vanity Fair, which is a place where the higher world meets the lower world, where witch men occasionally come to trade with outsiders. What Clarion doesn't know is that these tunnels are actually underneath New York City, and these tunnels are home to all manner of strange things, not just the Leviathan, but also things like rats that have the ability to make tools and fire and have their own miniature market. And Bad is known for trafficking and selling young feral children at Vanity Fair. As they're approaching Vanity Fair, Claren explains that he doesn't feel down about his god not existing because it just means he now has the opportunity to make his own gods out of his own ideals and his own morals. And after Bad leaves him to make sure that it's safe, Clarion uses his powers to locate Tikal and apparently Tikal has killed a rat king and this has earned him favor with the Leviathan and apparently the Leviathan wants revenge on someone known as the Hunter of Children, Ebenezer Bad. Meanwhile with Bad, it's revealed that he was indeed planning on trading Clarion over his own blood because all witch people are related down the line for a bag of porn and a bunch of alcohol. And Clarion just says to himself, now I know the meaning of betrayal. And Clarion uses his magic to summon the Leviathan and turn it into a feral attacking machine. Just as Bad changed his mind, but it's too late for that. Clarion has the Leviathan take the lives of all the men that ever hurt the children, including Bad. The Leviathan actually wants Clarion to join them, but Clarion's like, no, I want to go and see the world. I want to go on an adventure. Also, one of the Leviathan children is like, recently a shiny man visited us, but he left us this oversized helmet. It's just too big for us. And Clarion's like, we'll turn it upside down. And now it's an amazing pot. You just have to look at things from a different perspective. After this, the children take Clarion to a subway station and Clarion sees the light for the first time. And he begins to run upstairs and he looks into the sky, seeing the blue deep sky for the first time in his life and he's so excited. He tries to use his dice to decide where he's going to go, but that's when a man known as Mr. Melmoth approaches him. We then cut to a meeting that Mr. Melmoth is directly involved in, and they're discussing the missing Roanoke colony. You see, at some point around 1590, a colony of Puritans known as the Roanoke colony vanished. They only left one word carved into a tree behind as a clue as to where they went, and this word was Croatoan. But Melmoth has more information. He tells them that the colonists had contact with a being that was above humanity. And this contact was very intimate. So after nine months passed and the women of the colony gave birth to children that were not human, they were very, very different. The colonists turned to a different religion and decided to bury their sins deep underground. And that is how the witch people and Limbo Town was formed. Which brings us to Melmoth in the modern day. He says that he runs a hostel for children with unusual attributes where they are taught the skills they need to survive. So after Melmoth ran into Clarion and Clarion was just fascinated by every tiny little thing. Apparently he watched a TV and he was so amazed by it. He just kept laughing until he threw up. And then Clarion revealed that he was from Limbo Town. Melmoth knew exactly what Clarion was. And Melmoth plans to use Clarion to take all of these men to Limbo Town so they can plunder it. And Melmoth promises that they will go in style. Following this, we see Clarion in a car speeding through the streets of New York and Clarion is terrified. He had never seen a car before today. This is his first time in one and he is so shocked at how fast they are going. When the car finally stops, Clarion gets out, he vomits then asks if they can do it again. But they can't go right away because they have to break into a museum of golden age artifacts. Clarion has Tikal sneak in and spy on the guards so they can get in safely. Once they're inside, they cause a commotion to get rid of the guards. And then Clarion and this one other gang leader boy go up to a massive drill, which is what Mr. Melmoth was looking for. And they drive the drill 
back to Melmoth. Now this gang leader kid, Billy, does not like Clarion. He does not want Clarion there. Billy turns 16 in just a few hours, by the way. But Billy threatens Teekle and Melmoth does warn Billy that he should not go up against Clarion. He tells him that Clarion is a witch person and curses come as naturally to him as breathing does to a regular human. Melmoth even tells Clarion that where he's from, they keep their familiars small and inside of their bodies, but other than that, they're basically the exact same. He also reminds Billy that come midnight, he'll be moving to a different team anyway because he'll be 16. But then Billy throws a can at Teekle so the other kids trip him over and then Billy attacks Clarion. So Clarion threatens to show Billy the date and hour of his death. This makes Billy just about turn his pants brown. And that night as midnight hits, Billy leaves his room and he sees his friend Golden Boy who had been missing for a while in the hallway. Now Golden Boy is on Team Red, which is the team Billy's supposed to be joining. So Billy's like, where have you been? And Golden Boy reveals that Team Red is a hard labor gang. They take control of your body and mind and they put you in hard labor and you're conscious through all of it. And that's when Mr. Melmoth appears, opens up an Erdl gate and the two of them are taken to the Red Place where they will be cursed to do hard labor for the rest of their lives. What Mr. Melmoth doesn't know is Clarion saw all of this through Teekle's eyes. So Clarion leaves with the intention of continuing his travels. Teekle naturally goes with him and is like, you need to go save Limbo Town. And Clarion is like, he'll never find the town without me. And anyway, it's not my problem. The submissionaries will protect the town. And Teekle just stays in place. And Clarion tries walking off without Teekle, gets frustrated turns right back around and the two of them descend into the depths once more. But Clarion broke the law. He went past the wicket gate without permission. So now he has to be burnt at the stake. Clarion tries to explain everything he's seen, everything he's learned, all the truths that he knows now, but no one will listen to him. And that's when the ground shakes and Mr. Melmoth appears. He steps out of the drill and says, daddy's home because Mr. Melmoth is Ishida. He is the being that was above humanity that the Roanoke colony came in contact with, meaning all witch people are descended from Mr. Melmoth. Beulah sets Clarion free and tells him to go and ring the Sabbath bell nine times. Meanwhile, the witch people will try to fight back, but Melmoth has guns. Melmoth plans to turn Limbo Town into a breeding facility for part Shida, part human slaves. But Clarion rings the bells and this summons the Grundies back to the town to defend the town from outsiders. Meanwhile, submissionary Judah appears, clinging on to what remains of his life. And he tells Clarion that there are no more submissionaries. He is dying and the other two have already passed away. It was them that formed the Horrigle. It was them that were hit by the train. He tells Clarion to take the submissionary rod, to take his familiar cat, Teekle, and say, come Horrigle, come. Horrigle hunt, Horrigle hunt. Clarion begins the chant and as he says it, a glowing map appears before him. Meanwhile, the witch people are losing the fight badly and Melmoth is talking about how he plans to use the witch women and witch girls as sex objects. And he also says the true Croatoan is actually an artificial intelligence that takes the form of two dice. Melmoth then finds Judah and while he's distracted by the submissionary's dying corpse, Clarion in its horrible form appears and makes quick work of Melmoth's personal guard and then turns his attention to Melmoth himself. Clarion consumes his body but before he died Melmoth lit a fire and Melmoth's veins are filled with waters from the cauldron of rebirth meaning Melmoth is immortal. Melmoth says that the Shida are harrowing the planet anyway, so he's just gonna return to Limbo Town when there's no one else to defend them. Meanwhile, Clarion is trapped in his horrible form, merged with Teekel, unable to escape. But witch women learn secrets that witch men and witch boys never learn, like how to heal the beast out of a witch boy. After things have settled down, Clarion says he'll send a monster made up of 250 children to defend the town and that the town has to seal off the wicket gate so no one can ever enter the town and it will be cut off from the rest of reality forever. His mother wants Clarion to stay and become the new submissionary because it's a secure job for life. But Clarion says, 
not my life. I want to be many things before I die. And today, I'm going to be a soldier. And he gets into the drill and leaves Limbo Town to start his new life. And that's where the story ends. Of all the Seven Soldiers stories, this one is my favorite. It's not objectively the best, but for me, it's like the one that resonates the most with me. In terms of the occult, there's elements of it like there is in all Seven Soldiers stories, but there isn't really much of it there, which is kind of ironic because he is called Clarion the Witch Boy. But I would say there's a fair amount of Kabbalah involved in this story. So in Kabbalah, you can actually divide up the Tree of Life both vertically and horizontally. Right in the middle of the Tree of Life, you have Tiferet, which is a seraph or one of these spheres. And this sphere represents the passage of physical energy into spiritual energy and spiritual or magical energy into physical energy. It is also a sphere that represents sacrifice and it's also called the child sphere. Clarion is Tiferet. It's in his name. He's Clarion the witch boy. He wants to remain a child forever. He's basically Peter Pan, but on top of that, he sacrifices something in every single issue. In issue one, he sacrifices his belief system when he leaves the wicked gate, knowing he will probably be punished. In issue two, he learns the truth of his belief system, but then he sacrifices one of his own blood to get revenge for these children so he can gain favor with them and enter the blue rafters. At the end of issue three, he ends up descending back down to Limbo Town fully well knowing he'll probably be punished and never be able to leave Limbo Town again, but he has to do it to save the town. And in issue four, he ends up cutting off Limbo Town from the rest of reality, knowing he can never return to the town now that he has the town's favor because he wants to explore. He cannot have the place he was born and his future at the same time. Where Tiferet is where spiritual energy becomes physical and physical energy becomes spiritual or magical, you cannot have both at the same time. It's one or the other. That's why this sphere of sacrifice exists. And that's what Clarion is. He cannot visit Limbo Town if he chooses to explore the rest of the world. And he cannot explore the rest of the world if he stays in Limbo Town and becomes a submissionary. There's obviously a lot more to Kabbalah than that. Kabbalah is incredibly involved. I'm actually very lucky where I'm the child of an occultist and a traditional Kabbalist. So I was able to learn about it from a very, very young age. Even outside of Kabbalah, there's also parallels between Clarion and Baphomet, as in the divine androgyne that people think is a demon for some reason, but it's not a demon, it's a divine androgyne. It's the whole thing. I think if you're going to write Clarion, this story is how it should be done. Every writer should pay attention to this story when it comes to Clarion because he gets misinterpreted so often. Lots of people think he's just a bad guy, but no, he is curious. He's never seen most of this world before and he wants to experience all of it. And he wants to experience all of it in multiple different ways. He wants to see things from multiple angles. Because of that, he will hurt people occasionally. He will be a villain occasionally, but it's never from a place of malice. It's just from a place of, he doesn't know better. I will say, if I had to choose a character in DC Comics that I am most like, it is Clarion the Witch Boy without a doubt because I don't understand the world. I'm questioning everything at every corner. And then I'm also like, child of an occultist and a long line of occultists. And I know lots of people are gonna say, well, what about Tim Drake? I thought you loved Tim Drake. I do love Tim Drake. Tim Drake is who I aspire to be like. Tim Drake is what stops me from being 100% like Clarion, where Clarion is sometimes a villain. If I just focus on Tim Drake, I go about my business in a good way. He's my order. Clarion is who I truly am and I'm, honestly a being of chaos. I just wish that more writers would pay attention to this story because no, this is not how Clarion started. When Clarion first started, he was a full-on villain. But because this story exists, making Clarion a full-on villain now or making him a full-on good guy doesn't do him justice. Clarion is currently in Raven, Daughter of Darkness and it's not good. I'm gonna be covering it soon, but if you're curious, check it out because he is in that at the moment, but it's not good. I'm just very particular when it comes to Clarion and Clarion being on a team made me raise my eyebrows, but I was like, it could work, but it has to be very, very specific on how he views everyone else in the team. But no, he's being written as like an agent for Baron Winters. And it's like, that that's not Clarion. Clarion doesn't work for other people. He works for himself. He wouldn't be an agent for anyone. Finally, ending on a positive note, I just want to say thank you to all of you that 
really liked my Zatanna video. That video did really well. Most people watched about 90% of that video. That doesn't happen. Most people tune out after about five minutes. Everyone stayed around for near enough the entire video, which I'm so happy about, so thank you. I will be covering the rest of the Seven Soldiers series, but I'll only be doing one or two a month, depending on the month. But seriously, thank you so much. I've wanted to take my channel in this direction for such a long time, where I cover the more obscure stories. And I've just been slightly too scared to, because I've always been like, oh, I'm the Teen Titans guy. People want to see me talk about the Teen Titans. Totally ignoring that when I first started this channel, and when I had my first sort of hit of success on this channel, it wasn't actually from the Teen Titans, which I still love and I'm still going to be talking about by the way, but it was from obscure characters and that's where my passion is. I love talking about obscure things and I really can't wait to sort of explore this chapter with all of you, so thank you so much. It's super effective! Okay guys, that is it for today. So what do you think of Clarion and which character in DC are you the most like? Please let me know in the comments down below. Also don't forget to thumbs up, subscribe to all of my social links. Also don't forget to check out my Patreon if you want to support the show. For just one dollar, you get early access to all of my videos. Or if Patreon's not your thing, I do have a PayPal donation link. But for now, my name is Faust, this has been Exploring Comics, and it is super effective.